Now let's take a look at this virtualization vulnerability. But before we begin, I'm obliged to remind you that this is not a pipe. However, this is a virtual box. All right, so this vulnerability is in the VirtualBox software, and it's specifically in the Open Host Controller Interface virtualization portion. So OHCI was an early USB and firewall specification, and it concerned itself with these layers of the stack. So you've got, you know, some software that wants to receive USB data. You've got a USB device, and how do they talk to each other? Well, there's a specced out host controller, which is meant to go in hardware and a host controller driver which knows how to interact with that specific hardware interface. So in a traditional piece of hardware that's not using virtualization, that would look roughly like this. You've got an OS kernel, you've got a host controller driver, and you've got that app that wants USB data. And then you've got some piece of hardware, CPH, CPU, PCH, SOC, uh, Northbridge, Southbridge, whatever. Uh, you've got some hardware that implements the actual host controller hardware registers and so forth that are spec'd out in the spec. And then that's going to be a separate thing from the operating system running on the CPU. Therefore, it should be treated as distrusted. Then you've got a USB device. And of course, oftentimes we can imagine that USB devices could be malicious, not just in the sense that, you know, maybe they're like a rubber ducky that provides, you know, automated keystroke input, but they're an actual customized chunk of hardware that knows how to send totally acid, invalid transactions that might get fed through and compromise kernel software or application software. So the important part here is that the host controller hardware talks to the host controller driver and there's asset exchange between them and they should be mutually mistrustful. Now, I have this as hardware and it is meant to be true hardware, but I show this as mutual asset just because uh, there can be implementations of these host controllers and USB hardware. The, the specs have all moved on from OHCI. They've you know evolved past that and XHCI is the latest one but there can be sort of firmware components to this as well. So it's not always pure hardware. There may be a firmware component that may need to be mistrustful of the host side from the operating system. So that's what it would look like for real hardware. Now let's look at it for virtualization. So as I said, VirtualBox is a hypervisor by Oracle, and it has to virtualize this OHCI host controller hardware. So basically the software has to pretend to be this side so that a operating system, an unmodified operating system, Linux, Windows, whatever, inside of the virtual machine should have its normal host controller driver in the kernel and it should be able to talk to a virtual host controller just like it would talk to a real host controller. So that would look roughly like this. You've got your operating system kernel, you've got your user space kernel space separation. I've denoted them as ring zero, ring three here. If you don't know about rings, you can learn about that in OST2 architecture 4001, but basically it's uh, Intel's privilege separation mechanism. And we say that user space is the least privileged and it's called ring three. Kernel space is ring zero and it's the most privileged. The reason I bring this up is because when you're looking at the virtual box code, there's gonna be some stuff saying, you know, if defined in ring three, and that is because the actual virtual host controller will be code that runs in ring three. So we've got our privilege separation boundary here, as usual. We've got a virtual box application. That's what you, the human, typically think of yourself as interacting with. So that's going to be an app that runs in user space. There's also going to be some sort of kernel space driver that uh, allows for this application to sort of manage the virtual machine so that the virtual machine thinks it's running directly on the real hardware, but sometimes that's being shuttled through to the kernel space, and other times, as in the case of this vulnerability, it's being shuttled through to user space. Then we've got the virtual machine, which here I'm sort of representing as being user space. It's sort of unprivileged code in this sense. It doesn't have direct access to registers or anything like that. It doesn't have direct access to page tables. So inside the virtual machine, you've got a unmodified OS kernel, an unmodified operating system host controller driver. That's that code. Then we've got to have a privilege separation boundary between these two things because you're expecting that usually the software over here is, you know, isolated and jailed and restricted from interacting with the operating system. It's supposed to just think, you know, it's running its own little operating system. It shouldn't be able to, for instance, call arbitrary system calls in the operating system or, you know, perform arbitrary API calls. So this is back to now what the virtual physical situation looked like.
we have a now virtual host controller that is this piece right here we've got the unmodified operating system host controller driver that's that part there and these two are going to talk to each other so you usually might throw something like an untrusted application inside of a virtual machine or you know maybe you're running your browser inside of a virtual machine to avoid if it gets compromised from it compromising your entire system but in the context of virtualization attacks and escapes, we can imagine that an attacker ran their code in user space and then whoop, they go up and bang, they now are going to compromise kernel space inside of the VM. And at this point, so they can interact with the interfaces available to kernel space, including this host controller interface. The driver talks to some virtual hardware and that's going to be handled by code running in ring three over here in the operating system. So now the attacker goes and passes some more acid and boom, now they've compromised the VirtualBox application out in your host OS. And this is what we call a VM escape, right? They were supposed to be jailed and restricted to only being able to run code in here and, you know, maybe worst case kernel code in here, but still the rest of the system was supposed to be protected. But this type of vulnerability that we're going to be seeing in this example is a virtual machine escape because they're breaking their way out of the virtual machine and then they have arbitrary code execution in the context of the host user space. And of course, you would imagine from there, they're probably going to then further try to privilege escalate and break into the kernel on the host operating system. Now, one other bit of context related to the code you're going to be seeing is there's a notion in OHCI of EDs, endpoint descriptors, and these you can basically think of as if, you know, the endpoint is like a USB device or a USB controller. EDs are, think of them like devices, and TDs, transfer descriptors, you're going to see in the source code, it calls it transport descriptor. It's not, it's transfer descriptor. Transfer descriptors contain the information about data packets being transferred. So TDs in the source code you're going to be looking at, that's sort of, you know, semi-attacker controlled data, that's USB data, you know, the actual literal buffers of data are going to be attacker controlled. Because this attack is happening from within the context of a presumed fully compromised virtualization system, the operating system, you know, fully compromised and therefore even, you know, the, the headers and everything else that's being sent out of the virtual machine has to be fully attacker controlled. Okay, well, now you're going to go find the flaw, and there's a reasonable amount of code to look at this time. I think that, you know, the core vulnerability is relatively easy to find, as long as you pay attention to the kind of things that, you know, we've taught for patterns to find this kind of vulnerability. You know, looking at different control flow paths, uh, looking at, you know, looking for words of power. And so I think finding the vulnerability is reasonable, like finding something going wrong is reasonably easy confirming that exact problem is what you think it is that's pretty hard because this is very indirect control flow in this code base as i'll show in the next video but uh, i guess point out right here they had said be paranoid in their source code when they had a sanity check and that's what i like to hear more people need to program paranoid so for now go and check out this code and find the flaw